Well, I'm here with Jim Kaler, Professor Emeritus of Astronomy. And many times I've had the pleasure of talking to this gentleman and showing classes this wonderful institution. It's a great place. This is really just I, one of the neatest buildings on the campus, I think. And how, one of the how, oldest. Yeah, how old? Uh, they put this up in 1896. I think it was completed in October of 96. 96. So it's, uh, I, quick, you, you do the math. I, I'm not good at it. Uh, but it's, it's old. And uh, it looks it, too. Yeah. We're, we're trying we're to get it gradually restored. 120 yeah. years here. Yeah, yeah. It was built for the grand sum of $15,000 by special appropriation of the state legislature. OK. And I would um, imagine, adjusted for inflation, that's Definitely. Oh, it would be, a, it'd be a more, uh, several million to put several this thing million. up right now uh, with, the, with the telescope as it is. It's a, a beautiful old instrument uh, handmade by uh, uh, Brashear, uh, the Pennsylvania uh, optician in the 19th century. Wow. A beautiful piece of work. And then it was, um, I'm sure, really far from the rest of the city. And oh, this was built, time. you won't believe it, this was built on the hill. On the hill? Yep. Hill. Uh, if you walk up, you actually are walking up from the Union up to this building. Uh -huh. And it, when at this time the Morrow plots, the corn plots I hear were about six times the size they are now. Okay. And it was dark, and the, no lights yeah. to speak yeah. of. This was, was, yeah. uh, was isolated. So it was just a lovely place for an observatory. Probably show an aerial shot here, but you can see now that it's really surrounded completely by campus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, by it's, it's, I mean, the lights are bright enough to melt you when you walk outside. <laughs> We've tried over the years to keep it down. Some of the lights are shielded, and then we had promises that they would be further shielded, but never. Never happened. And it probably wouldn't make much difference at this point anyway. But we can still see a lot of bright things on it. Mm -hmm. We still so show students the moon, which is a knockout oh, sight yeah. of this telescope. I don't care how bright it is, you can see the moon downtown New York <laughs> City without any trouble. <laughs> Uh, but the bright planets, Jupiter, Saturn, mm -hmm. uh, Mars when it's available, uh, it, it, it's, it's a st stunning sight uh, to it look. You, you wouldn't believe what people say when they see Saturn through this for the first time. They don't believe that it's ag ag they're actually looking That's at real. it. Like a, That's oh, painting, you've right? got a slide up there. No, it's, <laughs> it's really Saturn. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And you can see some bright double stars and clusters, so it's still quite useful. Uh, and uh, enough so that we've had it restored okay. uh, the last couple of years. Okay. And, uh, um, uh, put back to its pretty much original condition. And of course, a great uh, educational experience. It is, and we've got a spectrograph attached to this. There's okay. a, uh, a fiber optic system that runs into a room over here mm -hmm. where we can do bright, spectros bright star spectroscopy. So it, it's uh, uh, become, it's a fine educational tool. It was a research instrument in the early years. Uh, mm -hmm. The last research was done on this telescope in the 1980s. Believe it or not, oh. uh, it wasn't what you, but we were testing photometers and actually mm -hmm. making some measurements. And the students uh, resuscitated the old uh, 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 telegraph system up there and actually made some asteroid measurements in oh, the 1980s. That, that's which is, and, uh, but the, the, it's principally known for the development of electronic astronomy around 1912 or so, uh, where uh, uh, light signal can be converted into an electrical signal and you can make a direct measurement of the brightness of a star or anything else that you are looking at. Wow, in the sky. that happened right here. It ultimately revolutionized astronomy Absolutely. and it happened right here in this building. Yeah. Uh, so which is why is we a, are a national historic landmark, not just right. a, 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 but it was a historic place, a register of historic places on the outside. It is a national historic landmark, which is the highest uh, honor that the de mm -hmm. Interior Department can give to a, a building or an organization. Uh, that was given in 1989. The uh, observatory was made famous by Joel Stebbins, who uh, was the person who developed the first photometer. And uh, there is a, uh, what we call a light curve, uh, the brightness of, of a variable star against time. Uh, in the Astrophysical Journal for around 1915, made with this telescope, which hmm. is as good as anything you can get today. Oh, that's Almost. exciting. Almost. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's just beautiful work that was done with this instrument. Now, this pillar here, this has very This important is the pier. Time. This is the pier for the 12 inch, which is up there. The 12 inch telescope is mounted on, an, uh, on a, a large base, which we'll see when we go upstairs on this pier, and the pier goes down through the floor into the basement. We've got to get into the basement here. It's really interesting. Uh, and then you see the pier continues down, and then it continues down into the dirt uh, to, I suppose, some sort of solid layer underneath, mm -hmm. wherever that would be in Illinois, as far as you can right. go. So, so the telescope is not a part of the building. 
Okay. The building is built around the telescope. You can jump up and down like this and the telescope yeah, will shake vehicles. or shimmer. That's right. Uh, they're all built like this. All okay. telescopes are built like this. Uh, the, unless they have been used strictly for you know, amateur work or for, for educational work. But if you're going to take, you have a research instrument, mm -hmm. uh, but all telescopes are built this way. The building okay. is built around the telescope. You don't want vibrations transferred to the That's telescope. Right. And it or someone randomly walks through the door, yeah. you don't want to screw right. up the measurements you've been doing right. all night. Right. Hey, well, let's go upstairs. Yeah, let's go upstairs. Uh, you notice that the shutter is facing east. Uh, you go anywhere in the world and you will see telescope shutters, which now, let me, let me say this as clearly as I can. You notice that the telescope does not stick through the shutter. Yes, yes, very important. As Anyone you will see it. in cartoon, cartoons right. everywhere, it does okay. not. The purpose of the, the, the dome and the shutter, of course, is to sh shield you from the weather. And you have a narrow slit through and which you see light. things. And, and you, can rotate, you, can, the, you can rotate the thing around. I can find the little hand. Oh, and this chair is fun, too because you oh. need to look through the eyepiece, and sometimes the eyepiece is up here. So you can sit in the chair, yeah. and the chair moves around the room, so you can get higher. And of course, the dome rotates oh, the around. Dome rotates. I don't want to do too much of that, because it's, a, it's, a, it's going to need some work, and it's a little delicate system, but it works fine. And you notice always telescope shutters face east. You go mm -hmm. to a major observatory, you got a dozen observatories, they're all facing east. Why? Well, I used to think I love it's asking, asking the, uh, it's because the it weather... It is not a religious thing. That's right. And okay. it's not, I don't think, a prevailing weather Yes, thing. it is. It is. Yeah. Because yeah. The on the average, the winds way. are coming from the, from the west and the south, southwest, I see. Uh, around here. here. Uh, they rarely come directly from the east. So you, right. all, in the U.S., at least, you almost always position telescopes to the east. And it's become a tradition. Sure. Even no matter what, you just do it. Right. Face east. Uh, there's a catwalk out here in which you used to be able to bring students. Uh, we don't do that anymore for liability reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's kind of delicate. Uh, yes, the, the you bring the the this is the the original observing chair from the 19th century. The telescope points to all parts of the sky, and you can oh, adjust, run, the adjust the height of your seat right. to the uh, to. to the, and then the if you want kids, to look I'll tell this. you, grade school kids love this. Oh, sure. Never mind the telescope, they want to ride on the chair. It's not like it's a thrill ride, but it's, right. it's fun. Yeah. And you actually look. And yeah, we, look we still have a little right? bit of work to do here. We've got to get a new uh, rack and pinion for the, uh, okay. that, that is partly stripped in there. And these other, tele these other tubes are just the, This the is a finder telescope that is, is a low power finder telescope that's used to find your field. Okay. You center your object in this thing, it'll be in the center of this thing. But it's kind of hard at high power. This okay. is very low power. You, if you get something with high power with this, it's kind of, it can be hard to find. Mm -hmm. uh, here are your setting circles. This tells you where north and south of the celestial equator the star or whatever you're looking at planet is. And the other setting circle over here tells you how far east and west. Uh, this thing is, is fairly fixed. This one over here, of course, changes as the sky rotates or as the earth rotates. And uh, you then use a sidereal clock. Uh, to calculate what the position should be east or west of the celestial meridian. Uh, it can be done automatically now in big telescopes. It's, you don't even think about it anymore. Right. But here you'd actually have to do a head by in the head calculation, calculation to set your object. Where you and you can look through in here in the finder, then it's here in the main telescope. Now these other little telescopes <coughs> are for verniers that, uh, it, that set find setting circles for north and south, east and west. So I think only the north-south one actually works. <coughs> okay. uh, they're, they're little microscopes, in a sense, to see very fine setting circles up by the top of the telescope that you can't see from the ground. Right. Uh, you can actually set this telescope to a minute of arc. Uh, if you're very careful, you can set it quite precisely. Excellent. It's a beautiful old instrument. Uh, this, is, this whole pier structure was taken out and shipped to Pennsylvania for restoration a couple of years ago. It's fun to watch as they opened the shutter, brought in a crane from the observer, from the uh, O and M or whatever they yeah. are these days, and dropped the crane in here and pick it up through the shutter. Really? Uh, we had a hundred people standing around watching it. It wow. was spectacular. And that was uh, the cleaning. It was it was amazing. The fingertip <coughs> control the the crane operator had. You she she could move it a millimeter this way, a millimeter that way. Yeah. Amazing. No, I think I had the same crane operator bringing my fusion device. Yeah, into yeah, the yeah, yeah. She, also she's, pretty impressive. Yeah, they're they're quite amazing people. Yeah. Good. So that's the story up here. All right, let's take a quick uh, there, look downstairs. This is the pier that goes goes about ten fifteen feet building. down. Yeah. 
Yeah, we, but, we, we tell students is this is where we throw the ones that fail the course. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty... <laughs> it's kind of neat when the it's building kind of, doesn't actually touch the, the, the pillar. And uh, there's an old machine shop over here. At least it used to be a machine shop uh, to build instrumentation in here and here. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what it's being used for anymore. That used to be a dark room over here, and then there were graduate student offices under the old new wing, which is over here. Now, this little baby, uh, in the 70s, I think it was, we, uh, NASA was circulating moon rocks among to academic departments, and uh, they required that they be put in a safe overnight. You got this we found safe. this on the campus and brought it down those stairs oh. over here. This is, I don't know how big this thing is, but I, it, it's huge. How they got it in here, I don't know. They will never get it back out. Yeah, again. at least they were going downhill. Without a torch. So if, is it, if, can it still be opened? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think any, you need a safe cracker in here open it. For a long time, it was used for lunch. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's now just a, a, just a kind of a weird thing to see in the yeah. basement of the No, no uh, moon rocks anymore. Huh? No moon rocks anymore. They, yeah. they took those back after we showed them to the students. So there you are, there's your, yeah. there's your tour. Great. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. You know that big telescope we just saw that's here at the U of I campus? What's inside of it? That telescope is known as a refractor because the light goes through lenses. We have the very large lens here at the beginning and this large lens is important because the wider the telescope is, the larger the aperture, the more light it can collect. So clearly you'd like a really wide tube. But if you want high magnification, you also need a large distance between the two lenses, between the lens and the eyepiece. And the longer that distance is, the better the magnification you can get. So how does the light actually travel? Well, out on the side we have the image that we want to try to see. Light comes from that image. If it's a star, it's generating its own light. Uh, if it's something else, the light's reflecting off of it. But that's the light we want to capture. So, the light comes through, and the first lens bends those rays together into a focal point. But you notice that you aren't looking right at the focal point because the image would be too small. You then let those light rays re-diverge into your eyepiece lens, your objective, and then this lens takes those light rays and makes them parallel again. But it makes them parallel such that if you projected them back, the image is much, much larger. And that's the principle of the telescope. Not everyone has enough room to have a telescope that's many meters tall. Well, here I am with my Newtonian reflector. This is a telescope that's quite as powerful as many of the really long ones. But it works because it actually has the light go back and forth a few times through the mirror. So it can end up being shorter. The real key, however, is its width because that ultimately tells you the amount of light that it collects. And from here, through the various eyepieces, we can see the stars. Of course, stars are pretty boring to see because even with a telescope, they're still just a point of light. But the planets, on the other hand, change from a point of light to an actual disk. So you can see the planets. And one of the coolest things, and one of the very first things that Galileo saw when they made the first telescopes, was you can see the moons of Jupiter. You see tiny little white specks of dots in a straight line going across the planet, actually quite far out from the planet. That is quite possible to see with a telescope like this. But the best thing to see is the moon. Because when we look at the moon, we see some features, maybe you see some dark and light areas. When you look at the moon through here, you can see the mountains and the craters. And it's really quite exciting. So, the kind of small telescope I have is known as a reflector. It doesn't use lenses, it uses mirrors. Once again, you want a large opening because you want to collect more light. That light comes through 
And you might notice right in the middle, there's an obscuration. You're not going to get any light from this middle spot because there's a mirror in the way. The light comes in. It is again um, focused together. Those parallel light rays are now coming in together. They come through to another mirror. That mirror comes back and once again goes through an eyepiece type objective. This is the focal length. Beyond that would be the eyepiece, which allows you to actually once again see the image become much, much larger than the image that was actually captured. That's a reflector telescope. If you want to see things like this, though, which is a visible light image, you're not going to be able to do it with your eye. And that's because there's not enough photons to register all of these beautiful colors. You're going to need to do this with something that is like a camera, a digital camera film, or some type of sensitive CCD array, so it can collect the light for a long period of time. So to see something like this, or even more impressive, to see something where there's a variety of different colors, you've got to do something else. Not just have a long exposure time, but you have to worry about the Earth rotating. So here's a movie of the sky at night. And as you might imagine, the stars aren't really rotating overhead. They're staying still. The Earth's rotating. After all, we're eventually going to rotate around so you can see the sun again. That's morning. In this rotation pattern, if I'm focusing in on one, one object, this beautiful nebula in the sky, it's going to blur and move across the screen. So telescopes need to have a mechanism that allows them to move to compensate for the fact that the thing they're sitting on, the Earth, is moving. And that type of a clockwork, that type of mechanical conveyance, is an extremely important part of telescopes to be able to actually see these beautiful images over a time-lapse period. The other thing one needs to realize is that we have an atmosphere above the planet. If we were down here in gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, a lot of that, if it got through our atmosphere, um, could harm us, especially the UV light. This is where our eyes work. This is the visible light spectrum. And notice there's a few other holes here and there. And then finally some really large gaps in the ability of the atmosphere to block signals in the radio waves, which kind of makes sense because we use radio waves all over the place and that's because they don't get blocked by the air. If you want to observe things up in the sky, you can use visible light telescopes from the Earth or this large radio telescope array. But it isn't just that the Earth's sky, the atmosphere, blocks certain wavelengths. Even those wavelengths that come through, maybe not so much the radio waves, but the visible light, will get distorted by the differences in density in the atmosphere. This is what makes stars twinkle. And here's a beautiful illustration movie of it that I'm not convinced is real, because I don't ever see stars twinkle that much. But you get the concept. That variation in brightness is not due to the star varying in brightness but it's due to currents in the air and atmosphere and diffraction of different densities of the air coming through. So if you really want to see what's out there in the cosmos, and you want to see what comes out in this wavelength period, or this wavelength period, or this wavelength period, you need to get above the atmosphere, where you have no twinkle and you have no blockage from our air. And then you could see amazingly different stuff when you look at the stars or the nebulas. You can see what they look like in radio waves or in infrared, invisible, ultraviolet, low energy x-rays, high energy x-rays. And you put this whole picture together and astronomers and astrophysicists get a much deeper understanding of what actually happens out there in stars. One way this has been achieved is with the Hubble telescope. This is a large visible light telescope 
but it's up above our atmosphere. It's a satellite. And this is a marvelous tool because it's allowed humans to still see in the visible, but not have that interference and that, that shuddering, that twinkling from the Earth. Many observatories are on top of mountains, and that helps. But if you get completely above the Earth, it really helps. And then something like the Hubble, when you use computer control to make sure even though the Earth is, is moving, and it's moving, that it's always focused in one area, you can see amazing things. You've probably often been told that when you look up in the sky, those aren't all stars, many of those are galaxies, entire Milky Way galaxies like ours, far away, that them themselves having millions and millions of stars. Here's a wondrous picture that shows that that's really true. Looking at one image, and you can see obviously some stars, but look at all these ovals and shapes. These are all galaxies that are far, far away. You'd never be able to see this on the Earth unless you had a telescope like the Hubble up in the sky. That's what you need to know about telescopes and observatories and the wondrous things we've been able to learn by simply looking up.